Hi everyone, hopefully you can hear me. I know we're right at one o'clock. So we were going to just allow a few more people to jump in. So we'll give it maybe two more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. We have some more folks joining us. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us today for the Count Georgia Inn webinar. So basically talking a little bit about how nonprofits and direct service providers can support the 2020 census. So we're really excited to have our expert today, Ms. Talisa John, joining us to provide us with, with some more information on the census. I know I personally wanted to learn more since last year, really, um, just getting to know what I can do as a part of a, as a employee of a nonprofit, how can I support, how can I spread the word um, on the census and, and my colleagues as, as well here at PCA Georgia were all curious as to how we can get the, the word out about this issue. So we're really, really happy to partner with Voices for Georgia's Children and the Georgia Family Connection Partnership to bring you all this information. So thank you so much, Callie, for joining us. We're going to go through a few things to make sure everyone is able to hear us. So the, you should be hearing sound at this point. If you cannot hear us, please try connecting to audio. I know I'm saying this and the folks who can't hear will not be able to hear it, but we do have the instructions on how to get access to audio here. So we just want, we're going to keep this slide up for just a few seconds. So anyone who is not able to hear us will be able to at some point. Awesome. As far as evaluations and certificates, we will be giving those out. So after the webinar is over, we will send you a link with the evaluation. And then we just ask that you fill out the evaluation and then we will follow up with your certificate of attendance. So you will have a, have a certificate for attending this webinar today. If you are watching the webinar in a group, please just maybe take a quick screenshot or jot down my email address. I would love to be able to send a certificate to everyone in your group. So please just send their names and email addresses to me and I'll make sure they get a certificate as well. So my email address is nmcdowell2 at gsu period edu and I will put it in the chat box as well. So just to give you some information on Prevent Child Abuse Georgia, we are the statewide um, chapter for Prevent Child Abuse America, which is the national organization. So we provide statewide direction to build safe, stable, nurturing environments and relationships for children and families. We have a lot of great initiatives. One of our direct services is providing the 1-800-CHILDREN helpline, which is our statewide helpline. And for it's for parents, caregivers, and professionals that are that have the uh, child's best interest at heart so they can call that helpline anytime they need resources or information about the development of a child it's a great line to call even for our professionals we've also geocoded all of our resources on an interactive map on our website so if you're interested please head over to preventchildabusega.org 
and so you can learn learn more about some of the resources that we offer. We also have around 25 local councils throughout the state that provide direct services within their communities. So we are definitely looking to expand. If you're interested in becoming a council or learning more about our organization, please visit our website to learn more. And without further ado, we definitely want to introduce our speaker for today. So Ms. Kalista John, you can see her on the video right here. She graduated in 2016 from Emory University. And shortly afterwards, she actually joined Voices for Georgia's Children, a policy and advocacy organization committed to improving the lives of children in Georgia. So Callie is now simultaneously employed with Voices for Georgia's Children and the Family Connection, Georgia Family Connection Partnership to design and implement a Census 2020 outreach plan to ensure that we get an accurate count. And we cannot tell you enough, Callie, how important you are and how happy we are to have you um, because this is so important. We have to make sure that we can secure all this great funding and so we can support families and children throughout the state of Georgia with the funding that we receive from Census 2020. So we're really excited to learn more about that today. So what I'm going to do is actually stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over all control to Callie so she can share all of her great content with you all. So give me just a second to transition over, please. Correct. Great, so I just made you the host, Callie. Awesome. Well, hi everyone who's on here or watching from the recording. Thank you so much for joining us and for, you know, taking the time to learn more about the census. Like was already said, it's incredibly important and I've been brought on to essentially educate groups across Georgia who have direct contact with families and children as well as anyone in Georgia to explain the importance of the census and how the census works. And so that's really what we're going to be going through today. Um, three big things is what is the census? How does it work? Why is it important? And what are the resources out there to help you all to spread the message? So I'm going to stop sharing my video as well and then pull up my presentation. All right. So, getting an accurate count in Census 2020. What is the census, right? So maybe you remember taking it 10 years ago, maybe you don't. I know that I don't on account of I was 15 years old when the last census was taken. So my parents filled it out for me, right? But every 10 years, the census is conducted slightly differently and the questions that are asked may be slightly different. So just to start us all off, what is the census? It's a complete count of all people in the United States. And by all people, I mean citizens and non-citizens. I mean babies and grandparents. I mean senior living homes. I mean homeless populations, all races, sexes, and genders. If you are living and breathing in the United States as of April 1st, 2020, you need to be counted on a census form. It's been mandated by the US Constitution since 1790. It used to be taken on horseback, but it no longer is conducted that way. As you can imagine, it is no longer conducted that way. Instead, we use the technologies that are available to us to essentially get this accurate count of everyone possible who's living in the United States. Like I've said, it only happens every 10 years. It's a decennial census. So it's incredibly important that we get an accurate count and we make sure that that count is correct because any results that come from it last for 10 years. This will not be conducted again until 2030. It's starting this March. And so now is when we're going out and we're preparing for this count. So three big reasons why the census matters. First is federal funding for our states, which we talked a teeny bit about before. Second is population data. It tells people in power who lives where. And the third reason is government representation. In my travels, when I've been talking to groups or speaking to people about the census, if they know anything about it, they tend to know that it has something to do with their government representation. 
they know that it has something to do with drawing district lines for their state legislators, as well as determining the number of congressional seats that we receive on the federal level. And that's true. We need to make sure that our legislators are accurately representing who we are as a population. It's also important that Georgia has the most representation possible at the federal level. Over the last three censuses, Georgia has gained multiple congressional seats because we're fastly growing, very fastly growing. This year in this upcoming census, it's kind of undecided what's really gonna happen to Georgia in terms of our congressional seats. Depending on their neighboring states like Alabama, the Carolinas, and Mississippi, Florida, along with the huge states like New York, Texas, and California, we may either gain or lose seats or stay the exact same, depending on how accurate of a count we get. Now, while this is important, and I just explained a lot about government representation to you all, most people do not know anything about how it impacts our federal funding or our population data. And I really think we need to have a conversation shift about this because these two reasons are the way that the census is going to impact every single person's lives for the next 10 years. So federal funding, every person counted in the 2010 census brought $2,300 to Georgia annually. That means that over 10 years, every person counted bought $23,000 to Georgia. That sum's actually going to go up in 2020 because of a variety of reasons to do with inflation, the federal pot of money being bigger, um, more programs being funded at the federal level. And so for every resident that does not get counted, Georgia loses those dollars. The federal pot of money that we're talking about is finite. And depending on the population counts, it gets divvied up between the states. So for every person that we don't have counted, Georgia loses those dollars and it goes to another state. Now total, when we're talking about the 10 million people that live in Georgia, that means that we receive between 15 and $25 billion a year from census counts. Federal funding may seem like a pretty general big term. What do I mean when I say federal funding? And the truth is that it's the programs that our personal connections, whether it be our neighbors, our family, ourselves, the people that we work with, our own network use every single day. So here are the top list of programs that I believe impact our children and our families. Medicaid and CHIP, so we're talking how people access healthcare. It also impacts Medicare Part D. SNAP or food stamps the Women, Infants, and Children program, school lunch, special education, and Head Start. So there we're talking three major programs that impact how thousands of students receive their education every single day. Title IV foster care and housing assistance. Now the total list is 316 long. There are 316 programs that are federally funded based on census counts and they impact each and every one of our lives every single day. In this list alone, which is eight programs, we're talking healthcare, how people put food on the table, we're talking about how people have access to doctors or specific kind of doctor, we're talking about how our kids are able to get a quality education, and we're talking about how certain kids are able to learn when they're not typically developing, we're talking about how some of our kids and our families are able to have affordable housing and how they're able to afford the apartment or the house that they live in. So when I say population data, I explained earlier that I mean it gives the data to people in power, whether that be businesses, government agencies, our, our federal government, information on who lives where and therefore what their needs are. So it informs our school districts, and an undercount could lead to overcrowded schools and under-resourced classrooms. My bet is that we've all heard about how important teacher-to-student ratio is. A ratio of one to 20 would probably be pretty good for most of the state. Some classrooms are a little bit smaller, some classrooms are a little bit bigger, but one to 20 would be a pretty good ratio, student to teachers. So teacher walks in on the first day of school and is expecting 20 kids in their class. But what if they walk in and there's 28 kids there that day? 
they are eight kids overloaded, and that means that that teacher's resources are spread that much thinner. It will also then impact those kids on the playground where maybe their safety is now compromised. Also, was that school prepared for breakfast and lunch that day? So it impacts more than just the classroom. The same goes for our early care and learning funding, where slots are essentially decided at the start of every year based on the population of two to five-year-olds in the state. This goes for private pre-K programs, our daycare centers, Georgia's pre-K program, and Head Start and Early Head Start. So any type of early childhood care that our state funds and provides care for, for our youngest, is based on census counts. We need to know how many of our youngest kids there are so we can properly allocate the resources that they need. Healthcare systems use it. We've already talked about Medicaid, CHIP, and Medicare, along with things like WIC and SNAP, right? But our healthcare systems also use it. Hospital systems, the big ones like Emory, Piedmont, or Northside use it to both open huge new hospitals as well as extensions of their main hospital. But also our community healthcare clinics use it. Much smaller consortiums use it. This includes our WIC clinics or community-based healthcare systems. We know the reality that Georgia's in a healthcare shortage. We know that 60 plus counties in Georgia don't have access to a pediatrician. We know that 70 plus don't have access to an OBGYN. We know that a number also do not have a dentist or don't have the mental health care professionals to take care of our behavioral health needs. The census provides the data to show what kinds of people need what specific kinds of health care and whether that doctor needs to be placed in this county or into another one. Businesses also use it. We're talking everything from Publix to Piggly Wiggly, Dollar General, gas stations, Chick-fil-A's, Krispy Kremes. They all use it to identify new locations that they could potentially expand to, as well as close locations that maybe aren't performing as well. Also along the business path, this is, tends to be a great selling point for a lot of people to complete their census form because of two things. Either there's a particular business like the ones I just mentioned that they really want in their county, like a certain grocery store or maybe a delicious donut from Krispy Kreme. However, it also impacts things like factories and production companies. So it allows for jobs to open up in the counties that we live in. I have been, when I've been around the state, I've talked to a lot of folks who say that there are not enough jobs within a reasonable commute to where their home is. A lot of our counties have to travel to a different county to get access to their daily work. The census, again, provides those numbers to prove that a factory or a production company or any other kind of business could open and have the job workforce to sustain that business. So I had a gentleman down in South Georgia, I forget exactly what county, but I had him tell me that he was going to form his entire census plan based on the fact that his county really wants a Krispy Kreme. They desperately, desperately want it and it's going to enjoy it. So many kids are going to enjoy it. So many families are going to enjoy it. And they always wanted it. I had another county up north tell me that they really wanted an olive garden. And when talking about this, it always put a smile on my face because I agree that these are things and businesses that people really want and show a certain level of economic ability. But on the other hand, I think we all know the reality that some of our families live in food deserts or don't have access to that job. So whatever it may be, I highly encourage you to take this business part when you're talking about it to folks. Our nonprofits also use it. We use it every single day and we may or may not realize it. This includes universities, our local governments, our library systems. They use it to plan programming and qualify for grants. I was talking to a county manager who missed a cutoff for a grant to essentially be able to expand the road systems of his county by 56 people. Those 56 people in this undercounted county mattered. Their account could have secured them a very large grant to potentially improve all the roadways in their county. 
This goes on to impact other types of grants as well. It's not only just infrastructure grants, but it could be educational grants. It could be direct service and programming grants. It could be anything that calls for a certain population cutoff. So every single person that gets counted matters. So here's a quick timeline on how the census is going to work. January through March is where we are now. We are educating about the census and why it is important. A lot of people do not remember 10 years ago when they took it, or maybe like me, it's going to be their first time doing it for themselves. So they need to learn about it. They need to know why it's important and they need to know how they're supposed to do it. They need to prepare, and we all need to prepare to be taking the census. March 12th is when the first mailers are going to be sent from the Bureau to every home in the nation. There will be a total of four mailers that will go out prior to May of 2020. They are staggered about once every week and a half to two weeks. So again, March 12th is that first mailing, and then there will be a total of four mailings before May. April 1st is what's known as Census Day. And in prior years, this used to be kind of a bigger deal before we enabled the online and phone responses. And there used to be things like March to the Mailbox campaigns um, or celebrations where everyone would come together and fill out their paper form together. And while this is still relevant, because like I said, everyone who is living and breathing on the United States as of April 1st, 2020, needs to be marked in the census form, it may not be celebrated or noted as heavily as it has in the past. So as of March 12th, both the online and phone systems will be available. 80% of the country is being given instructions on those mailers about how to complete the census online or by phone. 20% of the country, as of March 12th, will also have access to a paper questionnaire. The people who have not yet been given access to a paper questionnaire, so that 80% will receive that paper questionnaire in mid-April. They cannot receive a paper questionnaire prior to mid-April, and it will be sent on the, that fourth mailing. So everyone will have access in three ways to complete their census form, which again, is online, by phone, or on paper. It will be sent to all homes that have not yet responded on paper, starting in mid-April. Now, May is when we start hearing of people knocking on doors, and I think that's what a lot of people typically associate with the census. In-person follow-up by census workers will begin on the 1st of May. Generally, this is a huge deterrent for folks to complete their census form. People do not want someone knocking on their door. The only way to ensure that no one will knock on your door is to complete your form prior to May. If you complete your form prior to May, a census worker will not knock on your door. So if you complete it online, by phone, or on paper before May, no one will come, on to, come to the door. And when I say come to the door, I mean that they can come more than six times if they so choose at different times of day to try and get you to complete the form. They can come on a Tuesday night when you have been at work all day and you just picked up the kids from school and you're trying to get dinner on the table. They can come Saturday morning when you're finally able to sleep in. They can come on a weekday morning when you're trying to get the kids out the door and you're trying to go to work. So they can come any time of day, any day of the week, to knock on the door and try to get you to fill out the form. In June 2020, in-person follow-up will continue. It will go all the way through the summer because those six visits take a long time to get through. And in August, the online form will close. In December 2020 is when the results will be delivered from the Bureau to the government offices that it goes to, and then all of that funding will be distributed. Once that count is, again, I'm gonna emphasize that once that count goes through at the end of August, that is final. There are some sort of appeal processes that sometimes a county or a city may choose to partake in because they believe that they were not accurately represented for one reason or another on their census counts. 
99.9% .9 of times, they are not allowed to do a recount. There have to be major extenuating circumstances. So whatever results are delivered in December, those are final and they are going to impact us for the next 10 years until 2030. Something that I think is incredibly important to emphasize here is that it's safe and private. All of our information and all of anyone's information who answers the census is both safe, private, and secure. If someone was to ask you about this, the short answer is that the census asks nine questions and nine questions alone. They're about how many people live in your home and who they are. In past years, there has been something called the long form census, which has now been replaced by the American Community Survey. So this decennial census, everyone will receive a version that only asks nine questions. And I'm gonna show you a picture of what that form looks like in a minute. The other short answer response is that no one else can see or use the information. Now, if we're asked to explain it further, the long answer is that our responses are protected by something called Title 13. Census workers take a lifetime oath with the Constitution to protect your information. All information from census workers must maintain privacy. If they violate that privacy, they're subject to five years in prison and hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. And that includes the enumerators that are knocking on doors, as well as bureau workers who may be using the data every day. So again, it's protected by Title 13. Individual responses are private for 72 years. So some of you may have heard of cases where people are able to find information on past family members based on the census. I have talked to a few individuals who are able to find some of their great grandparents or some extended family based on census data. That information, any sort of individual identifiable information will not be released for 72 years. So my, for example, my information, which all it would say is that my name is Cap Callista John and I was a white Caucasian woman living in Atlanta, Georgia when I was age 25. When I'm 97, I'm not going to care as much that that information may have been released. The last thing I want to talk about is the citizenship question. There is no citizenship question on the form. And this is confusing for folks because of the publicity that this question received. 50% of Latinos still believe that there is going to be a citizenship question on the census. However, for that other 50%, they may have never heard that this was an issue. They may have never heard that there potentially could have been a citizenship question on the census. So when we're talking about it, if you are prompted about the citizenship question, I think it is incredibly important to clarify that no, there is absolutely no citizenship question. The census asks nine questions, nine questions alone, and none of them are about citizenship. However, Bringing it up to some folks may be more alarming if they have never heard about it before. So when we're trying to convince people to take the census and that they, it's trusted and that you all are trusted giving this information, make sure to be cognizant about when that is presented. So this is a copy, a sample copy, essentially, of what the paper form will look like. You can see that there's nine questions. This first page here is essentially identifiable information about who is completing the form. So this page on the left. And it has the instructions on the far left and the first three questions on the right. So it asks you, your name is the first question. Were there any additional people staying here as of April 1st? Is this what type of house this is? Is it a house, apartment, or mobile home? And then what is the telephone number for this contact? It only asks the telephone number if a Census Bureau worker needs to contact you because there is an issue with the form. Examples of major issues that a Bureau worker would contact you for is if maybe they've received five different census forms for a certain address, or they've received duplicate information in very large amounts 
with the same name or same address like I referenced before. So again, that phone number will only ever be contacted if there is an issue with the form. Now, the next four questions would essentially be repeated for every single person that is living in the house. And that is name, sex, age, are you of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, and race. And again, that information, questions five through nine, will be repeated for every person that is living in the home. So what is the problem? The problem is undercounting, right? We all may complete the census because we believe that it's going to be used for good things and we have been presented the information of why it is important and how we do it. But a lot of people do not receive that information. Certain populations, based on who they are and where they live, are less likely to be counted on a census form. This includes people of color, people living in poverty, dense neighborhoods with really high rent rates, as well as rural and geographically challenging areas. It also includes people with limited English proficiency, whether that be because they speak a different language than English, or if they're not literate in English. Maybe they speak it, but they cannot read or write. It also includes immigrants or foreign-born populations, as well as young children birth to five. So all of these groups can be characterized by the fact that information is more difficult to get to them and information can be more difficult for them to absorb, right? And that's because of the way it has been presented to them in the past. So our hope this year is that by engaging networks like yours, that you are able to go and give this information on why the census is important and how we do it to these groups of people that particularly are undercounted in the census. One that I really like to highlight, which is why it's in all caps, are our youngest kids. Kids birth to five were the number one most undercounted age group in the entire United States. One million kids birth to five were not counted in census 2010. That means one million kids were not provided the resources that they needed for education, healthcare, their diets, where they could live, where they could grow for that 10 years. Georgia had the fifth highest undercount of young kids in the nation. The states that we were behind were the huge ones, like New York, California, Texas, and Florida. Georgia does not necessarily have any business being in that top five list. But again, 10 years has been a long time. Major revolutions have been had in terms of right from the start, start Georgia, Department of Early Care and Learning, maternal mortality issues, the networks that have grown to essentially help our mothers, fathers, caretakers, and our youngest kids in Georgia. And so again, I think, I, my hope is that our youngest kids will have a more accurate and better count in this upcoming census. So how do we get an accurate count? We identify hard to count groups, whether that be geographically or through demographic characteristics. So geographically meaning dense areas of high rent rates and rural areas, and then demographic characteristics like people of color or people who do not speak English as well, or people of low income. We identify their barriers to participation and then we provide them with the census knowledge from a trusted voice like us on again, why the census is important and how they do it. So there are two tools here they can help us geographically identify hard to count groups. The first is the Census Rome tool, which can be accessed at census.gov slash Rome, R-O-A-M. This is a picture of what that website looks like. So when you go here, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner that box that says 205 Jesse Hill Jr. Drive, Southeast. This website essentially works like Google Maps or another mapping service where you can type in anything, whether that be a landmark, a specific address, a zip code, a county name, and then it'll zoom into that area. So I typed in the address for the Capitol, the Georgia State Capitol here. And then when I clicked on that census tract, that census area, I'm able to see all this information in that white box. 
And you can see how long that scroller bar is in that white box. It provides tons of super interesting and relevant information to address the population that lives in that area. It provides demographic information, including age breakdowns, economic breakdowns, access to healthcare, access to internet. It includes percentage of languages spoken in that area. Tons and tons of super interesting and relevant information, whether that be for the census or just for general work, honestly. This is that second tool, which can be accessed at census hard to count maps 2020.us. And again, it's a mapping tool that was provided to the entire nation from the College University System of New York. And it specifically displays three things, one of which is on the screen now, which is a red, orange, and yellow map. This red, orange, and yellow map displays hard to count tracks based on mail in response rates from 2010. So mail-in response rates, essentially it's the percentage of people that completed their mail-in forms in a certain area. If a tract had less than 73% of people complete their mail-in forms, they are highlighted on this map on a scale of yellow to dark red. So you can see a lot of my work takes me to Metro Atlanta, right? dense areas with high rent rates and lots of languages spoken, as well as middle and south Georgia, which also makes sense, rural and geographically challenging areas, high levels of poverty, low, high levels of low internet access, things like that. This map is also fully navigable, which you can see on this page. Same as how I typed, it, typed in an address, on the census Rome tool, I've typed in an address here in the top right hand corner. Now this map is showing purple, green, and yellow colors. And that's because it's showing the type of contact that a certain area is going to receive in the census. So like I described a number of slides ago, people, 80% of the country is going to receive instructions to complete their form online or by phone only. And they will not receive access to a paper questionnaire until mid-April. These areas you can see in purple. Dark purple means that they're going to receive bilingual instructions on how to complete their census form online or by phone. Green areas are going to receive a paper form right off the bat. They are that 20% that is going to receive a paper form on that first mailing in March. The yellow areas are essentially areas with a high number of PO boxes, or it might be an apartment complex, or it might be somewhere where mail isn't regularly delivered. Maybe it's only delivered every couple of days. And so in these cases, a Census Bureau worker is going to come in person and physically leave a census form. They do not need, to, the people who live at that address do not need to talk to that census worker. They do not need to answer questions in front of the census worker. And they do not need to be physically present to receive that packet from the census worker. The census worker is simply going to come and bring a packet with the paper form as well as online and phone instructions and drop it off and then leave. The bilingual instructions here, I think it's something that's also really important to highlight. So again, dark green means that that area is going to receive, dark purple, it means that that area is going to receive bilingual instructions in English and Spanish. Dark green, which this map doesn't show here on this certain zoom in, but if you were to look at other parts of the um, state, you would see dark green. They're going to receive a paper form right off the bat in Spanish. If they do not receive a paper form in Spanish on that first mailing, that household will never have access to a Spanish paper form. I'll say that one more time. So if a family does not receive, a household does not receive a Spanish paper form right off the bat, they will never have access to a Spanish paper form. 
The online system, as well as the phone system, are available in 13 languages. So if someone wants to complete it in Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, Japanese, French, any of these languages, in addition to others, they can do it online or by phone. But they cannot complete a Spanish paper form if they do not receive one in the mail in March. There are also tons of resources available in terms of fact sheets, posters, social media posts, videos that you all could share. One website is ours, which is everyonecountsga.org. There are tons of resources, both available in Spanish and English, on the site. We went around the state and we interviewed over 100 people, community leaders like yourselves, that reach people and people trust every single day around Georgia. We stopped in many counties, over 25, to interview these folks. It includes teachers, doctors, community, community advocates. It includes pastors, rabbis. It includes sheriffs and fire chiefs. If someone was identified to us as being a valuable, trusted leader. We interviewed them and we learned about what they had to say about why their community needs to know about the census and why it's important to them. And I'm gonna show you a couple examples of videos today. My name is Thurman Tillman. I am pastor of First African Baptist Church here in Savannah, Georgia. The census is extremely important because it's mandated by the U.S. Constitution that we should count everyone living in America. When everyone is counted, the community is in a position to be able to receive more funding, more representation in that particular community and in our community. Go ahead and participate with the census. Fill the forms out. Make sure that everybody in your family fills it out. Make sure your cousin fills it out. Make sure your cousin's cousin fill it out. Make sure your cousin's cousin cousin and your neighbors and your neighbor on the other side. Make sure that everyone you know know how important it is and make sure we fill out those forms. Everyone counts. My name is Claudia Martinez and I am from Claxton, Georgia. I teach at Claxton Elementary School. I am a mother of three kids. I'm also a student at Georgia Southern University. I enjoy being part of Evans County because this is home. This is where um, I grew up. I have a lot of um, experiences, a lot of great experiences. My kids are going up here. Census 2020 is a complete count of all the people living in the United States. So the census is very important because it takes it into account everyone within the community and it uses those numbers to help with federal funding and it helps building communities, it helps with the um, state representation and it's very important that everybody's accounted for so that the government can help the community. Every year Georgia receives $1.5 billion because of the census for education. That money comes from census counts. It goes to programs such as school lunch, Head Start, and special education programs. With the census, I'm hoping that everybody's accounted for it so that our schools can um, receive more resources like more books, more technology. I do think it's very important that the kids understand because they might have to translate or even complete the forms for their parents. Certain groups of people like Latinos are typically undercounted in the census. This makes it even more important that you fill out your form. Everyone needs to be counted. Everyone counts. My name is Amna Faruqi. I'm a community organizer uh, here in Southwest Georgia. I work for 9 to 5 Georgia, which is an economic justice organization for working women. 
The census directly affects lives here. What food children have to eat, um, where they can get their health care. We know we need more hospitals. We know we need more rural health clinics. We know that we need schools <laughs> that have better funding. If you don't get counted, in the government's view, in the Census Bureau's view, you don't exist. And we know that that's not true. <laughs> you do exist. Starting in March, you will receive information on how to log online and fill out the form. If you complete your form before May, no census worker will visit your home. Everyone counts. <laughs>My name is Jeff Hardy. I'm the campus administrator for SGMC Lanier Campus and SGMC Lakeland Villa. I'll be completing my census form so that I can ensure that I'm counted, uh, my wife is counted, uh, my family is counted. You always talk about voting and everybody gets out and votes and does their thing. Um, this, is, this is just as important, if not more important, because uh, this directly relates to the resources that you would get. In 2010, only 65% of Lanier County filled out a census form. Imagine if all of a sudden you got a 35% pay cut. What would that do to you in your own personal household? Now think about your school system. Every one counts. My name is Johannes. McKinley Jones. McKinley Jones. And I'm James Cornelius Jones. A day to day, I um, serve the community as a county commissioner locally here in Chatham County. Census 2020 is a complete count of all people in the United States. The census is important because the more people we count, the more resources, the more things that we can bring down here into Chatham County. How many people live now? Rocky is not a person. Rocky is a dog. There you go. More people will be counted in my house. As a matter of fact, this is your first time being counted in it. Next sentence, I'm going to be second, 17. Everyone count. All right, y'all, so some other resources that are available on the site, in addition to one minute and two minute videos like those I displayed, there are tons of really short and quick ones, like 10, 15, 30 second videos that could be used on social media. All of it's fully downloadable and free to use, so please feel free to use it in any way that would be useful, whether it's on social media or on your YouTube channel or in a lo lobby of an office, anywhere that you think it would be of use to have a video, please feel free to download it and put it up. These are some examples of posters that were created with those same leaders. So on the left we have Alvin Cooper and he is the director of Parks and Rec for Clinch County and he talked about how Clinch County doesn't have a formal after-school program and how Georgia actually receives 1.6 billion dollars every single year that impacts our after-school programs. On the right is Marianne Young from Muskogee County and she's a special education advocate and her child has a severe case of dyslexia. And he had a genius IQ but was unable to read. And so she said, she said that I hope that no child would have to language, languish for four years because no one knows how to help them. And how the census provides Georgia $300 million towards special education every year. My name that same content is available in social media graphics, so feel free to download it that way. We also have fact sheets like this one on the left about how the census impacts education. There's another one on how the census impacts healthcare and how census impacts after school programs. There's also more digestible information maybe for the everyday person. What, like an, this example of a five by seven card that explains the top three reasons to participate in the census. And like I said before, all this information is available in English and Spanish alike. 
Another resource that's really great is the State Complete Count Committee for Georgia. Voices and Family Connection both serve on the State Complete Count Committee, which is at, you can access their website at census.georgia.gov. And they have also tons of downloadable and usable materials. You can see this logo on the right, Everyone Counts. We use it on our videos, and it's definitely available for anyone to use. They have a local complete count committee toolkit. So whether you're already on a local complete count committee, or you don't really know what that is and you're kind of wondering, which is essentially it's a group of people who come together to try and help get a complete count in a certain area or of a certain population. There's a kit for how to get started there and some resources that they felt were most vital. It also includes some of our resources from our website as a part of this kit. They also have a poster campaign and you can feel free to download and use any of these posters. They also have the ability to customize their posters and it just uses PowerPoint so it's not very complicated. You essentially upload a photo, you insert the person's name and hometown, and then you can print or download or share as many copies of it as would be useful. However, I do have to preface that you have to get permission to use the picture of said person before you print and distribute copies of this poster. So this is essentially what that would look like. You take a picture of a person and you drag and drop it into the template and then you can change any of the text to portray whatever message would be most convincing for your community. They have a commercial campaign. The Census Bureau's commercial campaign has actually already started, and I've seen a couple I know on my television. You may or may not have as well, because that will be ramping up all the way until May. State Complete Count Committee also purchased its own Georgia-specific advertisements, and they have tons going out, both on TV and radio, throughout the state. These will all start after March 26th, so after the presidential primary. They also have some fun videos that you can download. We all know how passionate Georgians are about our college mascots, whoever we are, whether we're a dog or whether we're an eagle, right? All of these videos can be downloaded from the website as well. They have coloring sheets, table tents, bookmarks, and the table tents and the bookmarks are also customizable in the exact same way that I described for the poster. So please feel free to drag and drop a picture into these templates if you would prefer. Now, if I have explained, I know I've explained a lot to you all and I've definitely overwhelmed you with all of the resources and everything that is available for you to help get your community an accurate count. If all you have time or the ability to do is to reshare or retweet, these are ways that you can access our accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to just reshare our information. Voices in the Family Connection Partnership are posting five days a week, highlighting the census. So please feel free to reshare that. The State Complete Account Committee is merely posting every single day. So again, please feel free just to reshare and retweet to help get the message out. These are some further resources. We've already talked about the first two. There is also a Latino Complete Account Committee page of Georgia which Voices and Family Connection are also participating on, and that's accessible at yocuentonga.com. It is a landing page in Spanish with Spanish-specific resources for the state. The Association of County Commissioners website, which is accg.org slash 2020 underscore census.php, or if you typed into Google, accc ACCG census, it would also come up. And that is where you can find a lot of county specific information in the census, as well as listings of the current complete count committees in Georgia. So if you're looking for Fulton County's complete count committee contact or Valdosta's complete count committee top contact, you can find it on that page. The US Census Bureau also has tons and tons of resources available. Census.gov slash schools is one link that takes you to curriculum resources for pre-K all the way through 12th grade that could be used at Sunday schools, classrooms, um, any sort of place where kids are partaking in activities, right? Again, all subject areas, free to download, lesson plans for anyone to use and to teach kids about the census. They also have a ton of other resources 
that sometimes that website can get a little bit overwhelming. So if you do get overwhelmed, I would highly recommend checking out one of the Georgia specific sites that would then direct you to the ones that we have felt are most relevant from the Census Bureau. Both on our page, everyonecountsga.org, as well as census.georgia.gov, we hyperlink and we share resources specifically from the Bureau that we feel are the most applicable for Georgia. So please feel free to just download them directly from there if that's more helpful. Last but not least, before we answer tons of questions that I hope are there, this is my contact information. Please feel free to email me with any questions that you have that maybe you're too nervous to ask in the chat right now. Or if you come up with a question a couple of weeks from now, please feel free to email and I will happily help as much as I possibly can. This is also the contact for my favorite partnership specialist from the Census Bureau. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to have favorites or not, but this is Kristen Nespoli's contact. And she is essentially a liaison between the Bureau and the normal person as well as organizations. And she specifically has Census Bureau resources and information that she can provide. So please feel free to contact her if you think your question would be better suited for someone directly from the Bureau. All right. And that's it from me. And I think we're going to open it up for questions now. There we go. I was talking the whole time and wasn't saying anything. I just wanted to say thank you again for sharing all of that amazing information with us. I learned a lot that I was not aware of. Um, so thank you for sharing even the graphics and the social media posts. I think my favorite is just seeing a Georgia State Panther with the everyone counts on it. I thought that was really cool. So we'll definitely be, well, I will personally be using that, but we'll be sharing some information over at PCA Georgia. So if we have any questions, we would love to be able to answer those for you all. So if you would like to put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself or I, I will unmute you. So you can ask Callie some questions about the census, any that are concerning questions that you may have. And we can go ahead and do that now if you would like. I do have one question, Callie. So have you had any feedback from potential census respondents about immigration and just how that will sort of affect individuals in um, Latino communities that want to respond to the census, but there may be some fear around that? Yeah. So I think whenever folks ask me about whether or not I believe that there is going to be an undercount this year, particularly of immigrant populations, whether they be Latino or another of other descent, mm -hmm. I think the easy answer would be to say yes, that there's going to be an undercount in that area. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that this census is receiving more attention positively and more resources directed to it than ever before. And networks that have been put into place, including groups like the Latino Complete Count Committee or the State Complete Count Committee even, which is 100% committed to making sure that we get an accurate count for Georgia of all Georgians, whether they be a resident of any kind or not, is so much greater than it ever has been as well. Mm -hmm. So there are tons of resources out there, including the ones I talked about today, about how to specifically address concerns about safety and privacy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There are even on our website, in terms of the video links, there is a specific section on safety, privacy, and security. And a number of messages from people recorded in other languages, in Spanish, in Korean, and Japanese, on talking about safety and security, and how these responses cannot be used by anyone else. Got it. Awesome. That helped. Thank you for sharing that because I know those have definitely been some questions that we've heard in yeah. our communities. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, if we don't have any questions, we want to thank you all for joining the webinar and just listening to what Callie had to offer concerning the census. And we hope that you will personally fill out the census 2020 form and turn it in. And if you ever have any questions, Callie was kind enough to share her information. We will also send you all of the links that we shared, that Callie shared during the presentation and the links that we shared in the chat box. So again, thank you. We will be sending out the evaluation link momentarily. Thank you all so much for joining us, Callie. Thank you so much again for doing this for us. We really appreciate it.
Thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great one.